it's me again this time with the BBC Micro now this is a Model B um, this was kindly uh, sold to me via uh, from Anthony actually over at RRG uh, Riot Retro Gaming uh, I mentioned them a number of times in the last uh, week or two I was recently interviewed by Anthony if you want to know anything about me it's worth going and checking out uh, that interview but it's worth uh, watching their channel for the C64 Amiga Mega Drive Master System gameplays and things they do on their channel they're really good so yeah, this was described as faulty, but it has the, had the power supply recapped. Anthony uh, completely recapped the uh, old crusty caps in there before powering it up. So we'll have a look uh, inside the power supply later, but initially I want to try and power this up and just see what it's doing. So you can see this area here has had the uh, plate removed there. Now they, they were designed, you know, there was like a little thing that we could, you could actually remove it. It was, you know, perforated all the way around. You could actually remove that, stick mods and things uh, there. As if socket or something there. I might have a go at sticking something like that on there. But it did come with this. Uh, I think this is like some sort of sideways adapter or something, you know. I think the idea is, you know, that obviously that would fit inside the slot there inside. This would plug into one of the uh, ROM chip slots inside. You can see we've got a pin missing there. Uh, I could deal with that. I mean, the, the easy solution with something like that actually is to uh, probably just hack apart the thing here uh, and stick a pin in there or something like that. That's certainly possible. You could do that. You could cut the plastic away just around that enough to expose the metal to solder a little pin on there. Um, I, m I might do that actually. I don't know. I just don't know what the uh, usefulness of this it actually is. If it had a, uh, a ROM chip uh, socket on there, you know that would be uh, a lot more useful uh, and I'm not sure which way it goes it's going to go that way I think so that you could plug a PCB in there I'm not sure what PCBs are available for that but I could always you know create a PCB to uh, you know uh, a ROM socket that's that's certainly possible um, but anyway we'll do with that later and you can see you know it's suffered the typical well in most part this typically of this where the uh, plastic lipping here you know this edge where it hangs over the little edge there it gets chipped off there's a bit there that's just hanging on for its uh, dear life actually I'll somehow find a way to glue that down but I might just cut a piece of black matte acrylic and just stick it over that little bit there to detract the eye away from that uh, and as you can see it's had some damage here on the front actually as well along the bottom so yeah I mean I, you know I can live with it uh, but what I think I might do is just use some of that plastic putty again and create a replacement lip for that I'll do that later it might be another video I don't know um, I may not even paint it it's going to be white but I might just leave it like that the main thing is it's the shape I don't like the unnaturalness of the shape there but we can deal with that later too um, a lot of these belong to schools. Um, the BBC came up with the BBC computer scheme for schools and stuff, and loads of these went to British schools. Um, I mean, the BBC was sold uh, in other places as well. I think I, I saw some of them have landed in Europe and stuff over the years. Um, I'm not sure how popular they were over there. Uh, I think, was it Alan Stewart? I can't remember. I'll, I'll post a link to his name up here. We should watch his video. He does uh, quite a good overview of the BBC. Talks about the history and stuff. Uh, about Acorn, you know, because the, the whole bidding war there between Sinclair and uh, Acorn when the BBC uh, put the, uh, you know, wanted a computer, you know, creating, they put it off for tender and Acorn won it. Uh, so yeah, it's worth watching that video if you want to know more about it. And uh, you know, I'm not going to be covering everything in this video, um, but my memories of the BBC. You know, we had one of these at school, and this was the first computer I ever used a BBC Model B. I've never even seen or heard or used a computer in my life. I didn't even know such things existed really, other than beyond science fiction films and things. Um, so we had this uh, the uh, this BBC Model B. Uh, and a couple of the other lads picked up basic pretty quick actually, they were a bit older than me, they were sort of 10, 11 years old, getting ready to go to secondary school, and I was 8 at the time, I might have even been 7, I don't know, um, so they, uh, you know, showed me how to do basic, and that was what kind of drew me into computers really, that's where I got my first uh, computer, ZX81. The other thing I remember distinctly at uh, primary school there was a program, a game, I think it was, well it was a program, called Pod. And I'll perhaps show Pod later, actually, in part two or part three. Um, it was an educational title, and you just had to type in uh, commands, you know, Pod can, 
whatever, you know, fly. And he would, you know, if you guessed one of the words that was in his vocabulary, he would do whatever the action was, you know, that you typed in, you know, you'd, you know, you'd said pod can fly, he would fly. I think that was one of them, actually. Um, so that was a lot of fun as a kid, trying to, you know, be imaginative with all these different uh, words and things to describe what uh, pod might be able to do. And at the high school I attended, we actually had uh, some BBCs connected to the uh, Domesday project, which is kind of, it was like laser disc based, if I remember correctly. I just remember seeing the giant laser discs there as he swapped them out. Um, and it was, you know, based on the, the original Domesday uh, project, where you could look back at uh, the census of stuff from 1066, and it had all sorts of things like photos and uh, te text documents, the things have been scanned in. Uh, and you could view like the map of the UK, I think, and you could like zoom right in, you know, pick a particular area and zoom, zoom, zoom right in, like you do today on Google Maps and things like that on your phone. You know, the technologies that we take for granted now. And it was all pioneering stuff back then. There was nothing like that. Uh, so I remember being blown away by that. But the other thing we used the BBC for at school was, uh, and you, you know, if you've used the BBC before at school, you'll have come across the same thing. And that was uh, logo and turtle. Uh, now I'm guessing Logo was a ROM, some software you could put in there and you, you know you connected this up to a device called a Turtle and it was like a little autonomous, well not I was going to say autonomous, it's not, it's kind of a little remote, you know, a controllable um, pen effectively and you could actually you know, stick it on some paper in a large area and uh, plot out using Logo your pattern, you know, to draw something using vectors and things, you know. It could be anything, you know, a picture of a load of buildings or something. And the, the little robot thing would just, like, you know, follow the uh, coordinates, um, you know, and wheel along this paper and draw, you know, drag the pen with it and draw out what you'd traced using the BBC there. So that was uh, super interesting. I don't know whether any of those uh, have survived. I'm sure there are going to be some of those out there in people's collections and things. I bet they're mega rare now. So without further ado, I think we'll try and power this up and uh, take the lid off, have a look inside. I've already removed the screws from here, you can see one there, uh, one there, and then these two. I think those two hold the keyboard actually, one, one or two of these hold the keyboard, but anyway, so you need the, those four out. And then round the back, uh, there's just the two or three screws up there. Uh, and while we're here, may as well have a look round the back as well, so you've got the RF port there, you know, that's your modulator. I'm using a BNC to RCA adapter there, I've got loads of those. Uh, RGB uh, RS423 serial cassette port, analog in for all the joysticks and light pens and things, and your Econet connector there. So you've got the tube interface there for expansions and things, you know, you could put um, co processors and things in there. Uh, we'll perhaps have a look at that in a later video. Uh, one megahertz bus, user port, I think that's where uh, one of those little SD card type solutions is going to plug. Uh, if memory serves, uh, printer, disk drive, and then you've got your auxiliary power output here. As you can see, plus 5, uh, 1.25 amps, uh, plus 12, uh, 1.25 amps, and minus 5, 75 milliamps. So it was nice they did that, you know, so any expansions and things, you know, you could tap into the, uh, you know, the power supply there, and, uh, derive, uh, you know, supply. So just checking the voltages here, it's always a good thing to do. Uh, I, know, I know this was recently recapped by uh, Anthony over at RRG. You can see we've got five volts there. And if we measure between that ground and the purple one down here that you might not be able to see, minus five. Uh, and again, you know, we just check these other ones because they may be separate five volt supply rails. Yeah, five volts. Uh, and the one down here, I'll just remove my logic probe. 5 volts. Uh, now, strictly speaking, you know, I should get a scope on there, just just make sure that the you know the level of ripples okay and stuff. But I do know, like I said, that Anthony over at RRG, who, who provided me with this uh, BBC here, he recapped it, got a full cap kit, and uh, replaced all the crusty old uh, caps and things in there. So the power supply is good. So I've pointed you at the screen. Let's see what it's doing. Yeah, so it's just varying single tones. I did have a bit of a vibrated one at the moment, that one's a bit quiet. Yeah, there's one with a bit of a vibration a minute ago. So yeah, completely dead. So I've got the lid off here, and we're going to do very similar things to what we do with the C64 here. You know, we need to check the clocks. Later, I might get the scope on there, but the first thing I'm just interested in is whether we've got uh, any output at all. So one of the first things I want to do here is check the clocks coming out of the video ULA. Uh, so I'll show you where that is in a minute. So it's pins uh, four and one, two, three. Yeah, so pin four, we've got one megahertz. Pin five, we've got two. 
pin six, we've got four, and pin seven, we've got eight. So we've got our clocks there, and um, we'll just wind up the scope here. I'll have a look at the uh, CPU as well, actually. Uh, if I can, I can't remember which pin that is now. That's the reset. Let's just press break. Yeah, that breaks, making the reset line go low. That's correct. The next pin down is a clock. We've got a clock. That looks correct. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. I think the next one's a clock. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a clock as well. Um, so the clocks are all right. I can't see any issue with regards to the video ULA and the CPU. So the video ULA here gets super hot actually, super super hot, like hotter than a PLA on a C64. Um, so the other thing we're pointing out, see this resistor down here, this gets super hot. Uh, but look at the schematics, it's designed to be that size, it should be that crazy large uh, wattage size there to, to burn off the heat. Um, and it's that resistor is used in conjunction with these three diodes down here uh, and they're just used to drop the voltage uh, and this cap here as well tantalum they used to drop the voltage by uh, you know 0.7 volts each um, and then it's like a, this is like a little reservoir cap and it, the, it provides a voltage I think it might be this bottom pin down here actually the corner pin uh, of something like 2.5 volts roughly I think it's like a VCC2 pin there's a VCC1 and a VCC2 so looking at the pin out here, you can see we've got reset there, it's got a line above it, so that's active low. We'd, if, it's, if we saw a low there, it's stuck in a reset. So I'd expect it to just go high, probably. With the scope um, or logic analyzer, you might see it go, you know, be uh, low for a very short period of time, they go uh, high. Um, just to indicate it's had a reset, but if it was low, stuck low, you know, obviously you're stuck in reset. Um, and then we've got this uh, output clock here. So we'd expect to see pulse in there, SO, I'm not sure, but that's active low, it's an input, uh, and then the clock in. So these two pins in particular, 37, 39, and the reset, those are the ones I'm interested in. So let's have a quick look at those. Uh, powered it on, so that top pin uh, is the reset, and you can see it's high, so it's not stuck low. Then we've got a clock out, I think, yeah, pulsing, that's an input, that's high, and clock in, and it's pulsing. So we know we've got a clock. The other chip that gets hot on here is this Ferranti chip at the back here, is that some sort of ULA or something? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, mm, everything else just kind of gets warm, you know, not too bad really. Now I do have some spares for this, I've got uh, Rockwell 6502APs, I could swap that out. So I appreciate you can't see the part number on this, it's a 6522, you know, this is one of the vias. And they're exactly the same vias used in other systems, you know, you get them in the VIC-20 and in the C64 disk drives there. And a CPU, of course, I think you get in a C64 disk drive as well, they have a 6502A, as far as I remember. And I'll just show you something else as well, as we get down here, we've got um, uh, data bus connections, and they're all high. The data bus is stuck high. And if we look, uh, I think the, the, the bottom few connections are right there are address lines and things, but on this side here, these are all address lines. And again, I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see this, they are all high. The address lines are all high. Uh, yeah, which makes me wonder what on earth is going on, actually. I think they'd all be pretty much high, apart from some of the lower bits, I think. If it was trying to get, yeah, if it was trying to reset. I think if this was trying to reset, most of the address lines we would see as high, actually. Um, let me just check the lower ones, just to see if we've got the reset vector there. So it's time for this board to come out, I think, so I'll just disconnect my Logic Probe connections. And you can see I just tapped them off the 5 volt connectors there. And these just pull off, you know, uh, they're just little pull-up things. And there are five of these screws holding the main board in. And these are all 5 volts and ground anyway, but the ones over the one over here is uh, minus 5. So you've got to be super careful you get that minus 5 one right there. Don't accidentally stick your plus 5 down there, because, uh, yeah, you could be uh, setting yourself up for a lot of pain. Uh, so we'll get the screws out uh, and get this main board out, just so I can see what's going on with those diodes. Have a look on the underside of the board, see if I can work out what perhaps might have been done to this board previously. And when you're working on something like this, make sure you're wearing an ESD wrist strap. So just following things logically, I can see chip select uh, low on the uh, OS ROM here. I think the basic ROM is supposed to sit here. The strange thing is, you can't quite see it, the chip down here has got basic on it. So I'm not sure, I mean, this is an EEPROM, so it could have basic in two slots here. I've got no idea, I'm not really sure how you configure these and which ROMs go in which slots and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, I'm in the dark at this stage, but anyway, that aside, 
I'm speculating that we've got either a RAM or a ROM problem. Um, so I thought I'd shift my attention from the ROM, just having a quick look at the RAM, actually. And we've already seen that the address and the date bus on the CPU here are just stuck high. Um, I'm just wondering if it's booting from the ROM and then it's trying to do something from RAM and then it's just stuck and it's stuck at the address FFFF like in an interrupt or something, maybe an interrupt occurred and there's a routine that would normally perhaps be in RAM or something that it would be trying to run at that stage. Yeah, I'm not really sure, thinking about this now, I'm not really sure where the ROM is mapped and where the RAM is mapped, but um, in the address range there. I mean, I could have a look at the uh, memory map for this, that would uh, shed some light on that. But in any case, I thought, let's just check, th check the RAM. So each one of these RAM chips here, these are HM4816 chips. They're a single bit each, and you've got 16 of them, so it's two blocks of 16K to give you 32k. Um, now what you can do on these is I think there's an input pin, data in and data out and they're typically connected together and it's pin 2 so if you look at pin 2 there and then uh, pin 14 so you've got a short on each one of these just to make sure that the data in and out pins are connected together that's correct they are did that and then on every single pair of these they are the there those are joined together between the chips so for example if I connect to pin 2 on this one here, on this one next to it here, uh, sorry it's the one above it in this case here, it's this one here, it's a short, so those two chips are joined on the same data bit connection, so presumably one's the upper block, one's the lower block of the 16, you know, 16k blocks there, um, that's how it's going to be utilised, that's why they're, they're, they're joined up in parallel, so you've got like a, those two are joined, and if I test to any of these here, you'll see they're not joined, these are a different bit, so these two here I think are joined as you can see there these two here are joined I think there and as soon as it goes to the ch these chips over here they're in like a larger block here it goes the opposite uh, the, the orientation the orientation changes so this chip here is connected to this one this one to this one and I followed these all along and they're all joined up correctly in the pairs there the inputs and the outputs on each chip are joined together and they're joined up to the you know the equivalent uh, you know upper or lower block chip as well no issues there so from there what I've done is test each of these uh, connections here um, to this chip over here as you can see we've got a 74 LS273 I think it is and as we move the uh, meter around hang on, we should be able to find a join somewhere there you go so you can see this pair of chips here these two have got a connection to the 273 and they should also have a connection to this one here that's socketed now whenever I see a socket like this and it's actually under the underside it's been sold you can tell it's clear that that's a repair it's not a factory socket and this was a clue and this is why I went down this road here of just testing this connectivity and what I've discovered is all of the chips are connected correctly they have a connection to this chip and they have a connection to this chip apart from these uh, these two chips here let me just check it's those two let me just check they're joined together are they yeah so they're joined together but I'll show you so I'm in pin 2 of that chip there and if we go around the uh, 273 here a little bit of a bleep there but it's not a short nothing nothing nada and you can see those two chips here on the diagram we've got IC14 that's the 74LS245 there that connects to the RAM, you know, the wire comes across, uh, and where's it going? Comes across down here to the RAM, actually. Um, so this is, like I say, it will be used at various points to, you know, turn on and off access from the CPU to the RAM. Um, and then the 273 is used here again between the RAM on the left hand side and this chip here. Uh, it's not the video ULA, it's the SA5050, which is the teletext generator. Um, so that seems to need access to the uh, the RAM there. I mean the video ULA also sits actually on the data bus by the looks of things. You know, I can't, I can't be 100% sure that that's not faulty at this stage because it does get super hot. So I guess it's worth summarising where I'm at with this um, and uh, just talk about a few other things at the same time. You know, the first thing we did there was check the voltages. We had a quick look at the clocks uh, related to the CPU here. Now this board, you know, you've got a number of clocks actually. Uh, I think somewhere on there, there's, uh, well you've got a 16 megahertz master clock and that's divided down, I think you get like a, an 8, a 4 and a 2 megahertz clock, and I think there's a 1 megahertz clock, because at various points in time, I think the CPU slows down to like 1 megahertz to access ROMs or maybe the uh, tube stuff, you know, the tube interface there, I think any slower devices and things, it can, uh, you know, it can go run at a slower speed. 
so if you've got a problem with one of these you may want to check those other clocks as well actually but I wasn't interested in that to start with because um, I think I've got enough clues here with the symptoms to suggest that it's probably not going to be a clock problem we may need to backtrack and look at those other clocks at some point I'm not sure but I think the behaviour we're seeing um, provides some clues actually as to the, the nature of the fault um, so I'm not you know I'm thinking it's not going to be clock related I mean it could be it could be but I, I doubt it and I'll show you why, I'll show you why I think that. So we've connected our logic probe up, let's just disconnect the speaker because that noise is really super annoying. Uh, and if we just go around the data bus connections, these are some of the data bus connections here, I'll just zoom you in a little bit just so you can see a bit clearer. Um, as you can see, you know, we, we, we've got high, we're stuck on highs. Um, that's not an address bit, that, that's not a data bit, that's the chip select there. And then if we skip one, that's chip select two, so it's pulsing. So what it would seem to me that we have some activity on the chip selects there. You know, this is selected. None of the other chips have got a low chip select. The uh, chip up here, I think pin three, this is the video uh, processor, I think, uh, is high. That's the chip select on that. So that that's not selected. Uh, now that does get warm, as I mentioned before, that gets warm. Uh, but that's not surprised that type of chip generally do. We could have a fault with that. It might be a secondary fault. No idea. Um, so the question is, why would the data bus be high um, and the address bus be high? And the first thing that springs to mind is on the 6502s, you've got a reset vector. Now, the reset vector, uh, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, is something like FFFC. It might not be. It might be FFSD. I can't remember. No, I think it's FFFC. And then you've got two bytes that form the address that it jumps to to then start to execute code. So. I would assume that since this is the OS ROM, this ROM would be sitting directly in the reset vector of the CPU here. Um, and I think what's happening is it's just reading FF. That's all it's reading at that address, FF, and then the next byte FF, which then does a jump to FFFF, which is why all the address lines are now FFF. You know, the, 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 we've got FFFF. You know, four Fs as the address lines, they're all high, all the, the, the address uh, uh, pins on there are all high. That kind of makes sense, really, and I'm guessing because FF is an invalid opcode, maybe the program counter wouldn't increment, maybe it would just stick where it is. I'm not really sure, that's the thing I'm not clued up on. Now, I did write a 650 emulator in oh, 1999 or something, 1998, I can't quite remember when, it was uh, ages ago. Um, and I did spend an awful lot of time with you know 6502 uh, opcodes and things there, assembly and playing around with uh, 6502 code. I just can't remember for the life of me what happens when you get to FFFF with if you've got an invalid opcode at that location. Will it wrap? Does it go to address zero? You know, if there's a valid instruction, oh, well, yeah, it depends what the instruction is, I guess, doesn't it? I think that's why we've got a high address bus and a high data bus. I think it can't read the ROM. Now, I did try swapping this ROM for that ROM, same thing. This ROM for that ROM, same thing, which is a bit strange. Now, I have swapped out the 6502. It's exactly the same. Um, so, what? but what would cause that? That's the thing I'm having a hard time understanding, other than a problem with the ROM. Now, the interesting thing is the data lines are connected straight to the CPU here. You know, there's no buffering or anything sitting between the ROMs. Now, there is with a RAM. You know, the RAM, I think, goes through these two chips here. Uh, one of them, only six, I think, seven of the bits. And then the other one, all eight bits. This is the one primarily that's used to isolate, you know, with high impedance, the uh, the RAM at various points. Um, so, but these are connected directly. So, the next port of call, though, is I wonder if something's dragging the data bus down. Well, if I remove this ROM, and I'll show you that now, you will see that we get pulsing on the data bus, actually. Uh, let's just do that, switch it off. Uh, just get the uh, dip extractor. Uh, it's a cheap dip extractor, this, there you go. But the ROM sockets are pretty loose anyway, to be honest. Uh, and this is one of the things with these as well, worth pointing out. The chips have been in and out of these uh, so many times over the years that the sockets tend to be quite loose. Um, so just bear that in mind, you know, clean up the edges of the chips there with some very, very fine, fine sandpaper or something, you know, similar. Um, and maybe get some deoxit into your socket connections here. The other thing you can do, which I did, and it does make a difference, is just, can you see that? Just push the, there's like a little gap there. Let me see if we can zoom in just so you can see that super close. Yeah, hopefully that's not blurring. But you can just put your little tool there like that and just push them like that there. 
and do the same on this side here from the, the it's the inside you know it's the, the inside little uh, gap there you know and that will uh, I've done that for all of those and it doesn't make them fit better because you're just moving the, the dual white the sockets you know the contacts there to the uh, side and it makes a better fit um, anyway so now I've done that let's uh, switch this on yeah it's on again I've not got the beeper connected but if we look at one of those data connections now in fact it's not pulsing now what the fuck? Yeah, the interesting thing is now, now it's not pulsing. It was yesterday. Let me try and disconnect in the keyboard in case that's the problem. Well, that has come as a surprise to me actually, because when I checked this yesterday, these were pulsing when the ROM was removed. Um, but they're all stuck high again. So, yeah, there's something very strange going on with this. Something else is uh, making the uh, thing go high. It's quite confusing this. Now I've removed the other ROM chips actually. Uh, I'll show you, I'll switch it back on again and I'll disconnect the speaker. But you'll notice we've got that tone even with no ROMs and I think this is a clue really that it is, you know, you're going to get that tone even with no ROMs there. That It's not like the sounds initialise, you get the tone and then if you've got a problem the tone gets stuck. The tone's going to be there regardless, I'm pretty sure. So that's an interesting observation I would make. Um, but as you can see now, can you see that? It's pulsing both red and green alert and that's with no ROMs but when I had these two ROMs here it wasn't pulsing now that makes me think that makes me think that maybe the something wrong with the address in here of these ROMs and maybe it's looking at the even though this one's got a chip select set um, I don't know it's strange I can't quite make sense of that to be honest I don't understand why if you didn't have an OS ROM why the other ROMs would stop the data bus um, Having said that, let's just try it with just the OS ROM. Maybe the basic ROM's got a fault. Let's try it with just the OS ROM. So we'll get the OS ROM back in place there. And switch it back on again. And let's just check again here. You know, you see, yeah, look. The high again. Yeah, they're stuck high again. With the ROM in. So, it's very, very strange, actually. But the other thing is, the other thing that I find odd is the fact that the address bus is FFFF, you know, it's like it's maxed out. I can't imagine the address bus would be maxed out to FFFF if we had a fault with some of the chip. You know, say for instance you had problems with one of these wires or the video circuit or something, you, you, what you'd have typically is a problem at a specific address where, you know, the CPU's been interrupted, uh, you know, an interrupt's been raised or something and then something's not getting the correct spot response you know the CPU's <coughs> looking for something and it's not getting it um, you know maybe it's maybe it's waiting for the, a 6522 you know response on a particular pin or something and it's not getting it and you get an endless loop you'd be stuck at a specific address so to be stuck at FFFF is very odd and it's a clue in its own right so I do think you know it's having a, a, a problem reading the ROM but since the ROM is directly connected to the CPU here you know the data connections are directly connected nothing else can be interfering with them and as we've seen if I remove this we then get pulsing yeah I don't see, I don't see what else could be doing that actually I don't know it's a bit odd I mean there are other things in this system here that could be right into the data bus at the same time you know output into the data bus at the same time so maybe we do have a problem with a chip select somewhere else um, it's just strange how it would end up at FFFF but then again if that other chips interfering with the data bus and making the data bus completely high that could that could be causing the problem when the CPU is trying to get the reset vector if something else is output into the bus then I could imagine it jumping to the wrong address but then why would we see pulsing when we've got no ROM there it could be that when the ROM's there it starts to boot from the ROM initialises something else a chip select goes wrong you know messes up the data bus and then there, but how does this end up at FFF at that point because it would have already reset so these are the sort of things I'm thinking you see so it, it, it all it, everything in my mind is coming back to the fact that it would appear to be an issue with the ROM actually I'm just wondering if something is going wrong with the ROM and it's the addressing of the ROMs that's the issue so maybe there's nothing wrong with this ROM but when you've got, you know, it's maybe the, low, the the read from the ROMs, it's somehow toggling between the different slots when it shouldn't be doing or something like that. 
that might be an issue. I'm not sure. I need to go away now and look at how the uh, address decoding is done to you know uh, you know to specify which of these ROMs we're actually you know selecting at any given point in time. And the other thing with pointing out is you can swap this jumper up here. I think is it S25? Yeah, you can. You can move that and turn it into a 16K machine. Um, you know, that's sometimes worth doing just to rule out the RAM. And beyond that, you can also do a mod, actually, to invert one of the signals that comes out of there that goes to the RAM to um, toggle the bank. So when you turn it to 16K, you can then invert that, flip that 16K block, if you see what I mean, so you're looking at the other 16K. That's one good way, you know, divide and conquer, the whole divide and conquer technique there of trying to work out which half of your RAM is bad, you know, if all your RAM is bad or you've got, you know, a couple of chips in each uh, bank there that's bad, you wouldn't, that wouldn't reveal anything, you'd still have uh, nothing. Um, but I think, I don't think we're in the realms of a RAM issue, I, I do think it's going to be ROM, I mean it could be RAM, this is where my logic analyzer might help me out, I might have to get my logic analyzer onto this. Because let's say it's been from the ROM, and then and it's, uh, I don't know, it's sticking some stuff in RAM, and then it's starting to execute from RAM. You've got a corruption in RAM, or some problem with RAM, that's doing a jump to FFFF or something. I don't know. You know, I, I'd find that a bit hard to believe, to be honest. Um, I do think it's more likely the fact that it can't read the ROM and it's just getting FFFF as the, uh, you know, uh, reset vector. That's what I think is happening. But my logic analyzer there might prove otherwise. So continuing on with the old uh, ROM chip select thing, I thought I've ordered some ROMs in the meantime, ordered a, an OS ROM and a basic ROM, uh, just because these ones are a bit crusty anyway, it's only like £2 each or something, so nothing lost there, it's always useful to have a couple of spare mask ROMs. Uh, I don't have any 27C128, which I, I think I could use for this, I've got some of those on order, they've been on order for a few weeks actually, they're due any day now, so I could use one of those if those arrive before the mask ROMs, but I thought let's just you know, take things logically and just step back a, a, a track, if you like, and just follow the chip selects back to where they're originating from. Uh, and there's a few chips used. There's a uh, 74LS139, I think one of these, uh, this one down here. Uh, and this here is a, a NAND, uh, and it's a, a quad input, I think. Um, and there's a 74LS30 as well, so I've ordered a couple of those. They're only a pound each or something. But if I just disconnect the speaker, now I've not got the keyboard connected, and it's important to know you need the keyboard connected on these to boot, uh, but I'm guessing that would only be at a certain point in the boot process. I don't think we're getting off the start here with the uh, ROM, um, so I don't even think the keyboard's going to be relevant at this stage, actually. Um, until I see some activity on the, 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 the data bus there on the ROM, then that, you know, that would change my views. So I would then be probably connecting the keyboard up. But at various points in time, I'm keep connecting the keyboard up just to rule it out but if we just look at the output uh, in fact I'll show you this side first if we look at the output if we look at the output of this chip here that's an output it's high um, so you'd expect uh, we should have um, yeah if we had four highs here we've got high there this one high, uh, pulsing and a high we've got three one of them's low so therefore we should have a high that's correct uh, on that side of the you know that gate on that chip there's only two gates on there like so they've got four inputs one output so i'll do the same with the 74ls uh, 30 if i can find that and the other thing you can do here with the s25 jumper up here is from the top pin feed that into the gate input of a uh, 74LS04 and not gate, an inverter, and the output, send that back to the centre pin, uh, and that will put it in um, 32K mode, but it'll swap the blocks around, actually, um, and that's not made any difference, so it doesn't matter whether you invert that, doesn't matter whether you swap the blocks around, you know, just put it in 16K mode, it's just doing the same. Now there's a chance we've got a problem with both uh, banks of RAM there, the upper 16K and the lower 16K, so whilst I'm waiting for the ROM, I'll have a clean run of the board. Can you see we've got these like little white discolorations in a few places, like a bit of corrosion or something. Uh, you know, moisture has got there. Um, this is around the RAM area, I think, here. it's uh, I don't see any damage, but I will inspect just for dry joints and things. There's a little wire here. Uh, I don't know if it's a factory mod or something, but it's an awful... Um, awfully exposed can you see how much of it's exposed there but it's not making a short i'm just going to resolder them actually and just cut a little bit off the length there because uh yeah it's uh it's not great and it's the same down here there's you can see it's overhanging a fair bit 
I'll clean up some of the solder points on these contacts as well. I mean that chip there has been swapped out, but I'm guessing that's been done a long, long time ago. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, some more corrosion here, as you can see. I don't think this is going to be relevant actually, but you know these are just things par for the course really. And make sure you've not got any bent pins there. There's nothing short in, etc. I mean I doubt it. So what I've just done actually is dumped the basic ROM and the other ROM, the one with the uh, EEPROM is a Watford uh, disk drive ROM of some sort. Um, the basic ROM I'm guessing is okay, I can see lots of uh, text in there that looks okay, you know, I mean it's not like not readable, there could be a bad block in there or something, but this is the OS ROM uh, and the way I'm reading these as you can see is I've joined up the top two pins there so I've joined up VCC to the VP VPP pin, just wrapped somewhere around it and then joined that around here to the uh, that top pin there which is not connected just so that the EEPROM programmer detects something because it complains if you've not got something on those uh, pit two pins there and having dumped it here I've got the uh, download of 1.2 that I've downloaded and the one I've just taken if I do binary compare uh, I don't think you can see that match exactly so there is nothing wrong with the ROM so the next thing I'm going to do here, try and shed some light on what's going on with the data bus. Uh, it's connected to logic analyzer up. So you can see we're using uh, Alice and Chalice's uh, old LAP uh, 16182U here. Uh, it's just a, a basic, cheap, uh, you know, 16 channel logic analyzer. You can get one of these for around 100 pounds ish, maybe a bit more than that. Uh, and as you can see, I'm just using the channel A. It's got 16, uh, you know, it's a 16 channel uh, analyzer. This has got A to A0 to A7, and then B0 to V7, uh, and then two connections over here, clock and ground. Um, and I, you know, I bought a couple of these uh, things here, which give you 20, uh, not 20, 10 connections on each side, so you have enough for you know your eight data bits, and then your clock and your ground. So I'm just using one one channel at the moment uh, with the clock and the ground. So I've still got eight channels there we could use, but bear in mind it's a 16-bit processor. The uh, well, I'm not 16-bit. It's got a 16-bit address bus, the 6502. So if you wanted to monitor the whole address bus. You've got no connections there left to monitor the data bus. Um, so all I need to do now, anyway, um, and what, but what we can do is do it in two chunks. We can almost like uh, multiplex ourselves, you know. So we'll do the data bus first, uh, and then we'll connect up the, you know, the address bus. Perhaps all sixteen um, connections there, and see what uh, you know. What, what see what's what. Um, what I'm guessing is, it's either going to be the data bus is going to be FF right from the start, the minute it reads the first opcode or something from the uh, ROM there or it might not be, it might read an opcode, we might see some you know proper data in the data bus and it might write some proper data and then at some point it may then start just going FFFF you know, and, well not 4 F's because it's you know an 8-bit uh, data bus we might just see FF on the data bus in a, for a continuous you know from there on in at which point the, the, the CPU's kind of uh, stalled you know and the sync pin stops working and stuff uh, now if we then swap over to the, the address bus do the same capture now bear in mind we're not going to have no relationship there to the data bus all we'll, be, all we'll be doing is capturing addresses what we would expect to see there is just prior to us getting uh, to the FFFF address we would see a, a legit address somewhere maybe for RAM or something and that is going to be a clue it's almost like the last legitimate address it was addressing before it went crazy and started just you know FFing the data bus if you see what I mean um, so that's the theory anyway so um, at the very least we can see what's going on because you can't really see what's going on with the scope or anything like that in real time so I've got the Zero Plus software running here uh, so the first thing I've done is uh, we'll select these first hang on I can't do it that way uh, I'll hold down shift and I'll select the first eight channels there, A0 to A7, right click and we'll do group into bus. So that's our uh, data bus, I'm not sure if you can name it, can we rename it? Yeah we can. Let's do that, data bus. Uh, and then I'll scroll you down a bit. So use the first connection, the second channel there, uh, B0, to go to reset. So what I want this to do is to trigger, and this is the column here, this column we're looking at with the X's, the first column, um, that's the trigger, and as you can see if I click on it, you can see that, we've got the, I've got high, so I'll trigger when it's high, trigger when it's low, and then you've got, you know, changes there from uh, low to high, and I think we want high to low actually, that's probably the best way of doing it. So that should trigger 
when our reset uh, is it going to be this active low? What's the other way around? Actually, I think doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. So staff low, and then as it goes to high, it'll trigger. So that should give us a capture on reset. So what we'll do is we'll set the capture size to 56k. We'll leave it on uh, 10 megahertz, I think there. So I've uh, pressed the play button uh, on the top there, and it says wait here. It's just counted. So we'll start the BBC. Hopefully, there you go. We've got a capture. Switch the BBC off. Uh, let's see what we're getting. Let's hope it's just not FFs all the time. Um, bearing in mind there's going to be a bit of uh, glitchy stuff at the start with the CPU does its uh, reset. This is something I learned from my Famicom video actually. Someone uh, was kind enough. Are we going to see anything? Let's scroll along. What? What on earth's going on there? We captured next to nothing. I pressed break actually, so switch it off. So what I did is switched it on, nothing happened, then I pressed break. To do it to invoke a reset, and then we've got. Can you see the SFFs up here? I'll zoom you in a little bit. Uh, yeah, so the, trig the trigger wasn't quite right up there, actually. Ooh. There we go. Um, so, yeah, we know we've got all these uh, FFs there. Uh, let's just scroll back. How do we do that? <laughs> FF, FF, FF. Oh, we got something else there. We got a D something. That's interesting. Yeah. So after all those FFs uh, basically effing me off, uh, hang on. Yeah, so I've just done a capture without the ROMs in there, we've got no ROMs whatsoever. And right from the very start there, you can see we get this 00B5BD and then B50 FF, you know, FF again. And then it just loops around doing that. Now that makes me think that the CPU is continuously resetting. Um, or something else is outputting that. The CPU does, the 6502 does output a few bytes down the bus like that as it's part of its reset. Yeah, so it starts with FF and then it goes 00. zero. I'm guessing that's where the CPU's reset. B5, BD, B5, FF. Uh, and that cycle just repeats. Let me try another capture just to, just to rule out I'm not getting random stuff in the bus here. Yeah, you see, that's just looking like a load of FFs to me now. Yeah, something's killing the data bus. Let's try again. I guess the good news is it looks like something's just killing the data bus, and I need to go away and find out what is outputting on the data bus. If I do a capture now, you'll see it's, it's captured every time I've changed the CPU. Uh, now, I could have sworn the CPU was alright previously, so it does look like we've got a faulty CPU. Uh, and as you'll see, if I just, you know, it's still on now, the BBC, the speaker's not on, that's all. If I just click play, you'll see the trigger happens instantly. Like it's continuously resetting, which is what I would expect, actually, if there was no program running. I think. I don't know what would be doing the reset. There must be some sort of watchdog thing or something going on there. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. But we're not seeing stuck FFs with that uh, a different CPU. So, that's interesting. Um, I wonder if there's been multiple faults with this and just no, never noticed the CPU at this, until this stage. So, let's now switch it off and I'll put the OS ROM back in. And what I would like to see now is something different. Now, bear in mind, I've also got IC14 out at the moment to isolate the RAM from the system so yeah we're going to get a crash still it's not going to work but it might just give us some different behavior yeah as you can see down here it says wait and if i press the brake key we then get our reset now what that's only happening now because i've got the uh, 7404 as part of the reset circuit there piggybacked if i take that chip off and it's off now switch it on again let's just watch and i'll press the capture button now bear in mind it should wait it's just on an instant capture. And I press play record again, instant capture. It's not waiting because the reset is being triggered. Uh, can you see we've got a small reset pulse there? And if I scroll to the right, although it's not evident, it's probably done a reset somewhere else there. Uh, hopefully we'll see another pulse. See there? Another reset pulse. So we've got a problem with the 74 LS04 on the reset circuitry there. We've got a problem with the CPU. There's just multiple issues.
I hope it's not game over for this board. You know, some of the logic, I mean, this is one of the chips I checked on the Logic Probe, it looks okay. But actually, there's some glitching occurring with it, despite the fact the Logic Probe shows it seems to be working all right. So I think before I do anything else, I'm going to swap out that 7.4 LS04 there, we'll get a socket on there. Because as I've shown, without the chip piggybacked, the capture happens instantly. There's no wait for the reset. Now if I probe it with Logic Probe, this just shows high. It doesn't show low, but because the low pulses are so infrequent that you don't see it. This is the problem, really. This is where a scope may help with that sort of thing. Uh, I think I'm going to go around with the scope next and have a good look at various things, actually, because the things like that are super easy to miss, and you know it's only really the logic analyzer that's highlighted that. And the interesting thing is, at the start of the capture, you know, start this, the part of this video here where I started messing with the logic analyzer, it was working, and just over time, it suddenly stopped. The reset trigger and stopped working. This we started getting reset pulses coming through, you know, through the 555 through this 04 to the rest of the uh, circuit here. So yeah, anyway, I'll socket that up. Um, at least we know the uh, old CPU's definitely got an issue as well. Whatever the, uh, the another fault is has killed the old CPU probably. So after swapping out that 7.4 LS04 there, I wasn't getting anything on my captures at all, you know, other than the reset. I was like, what's going on here? The clock is missing. I'll show you this. I'll switch it on, disconnect the speaker, just so you're not uh, distraught by the continuous tone there. Can you see that? We've just got a high. The continuous high. That goes to the 7.4 LS32 over here. So just looking around the 7.4 LS32 here, uh, switch it back on, uh, that's this chip here. One, two, three, four. Hang on. Four. So the fourth pin down on that 7.4 LS32 is the clock. And you can see we've got kind of got a flickering high. Uh, and if we look at this import, it's got two imports. One of them's pulsing. You might not be able to see that very well, but it is. Trust me, it's pulsing. Uh, and the one next to it uh, is low. So because it's an OR gate, we've got a high there on the pulsing input. So what we'd expect to see actually is pulsing on the output. And we're not getting a flickering high. Um, and like I said, on the pin 4 on the CPU, it's just high. So we've got a faulty 7.4 LS32 as well. And that's just as a consequence of replacing that. This is just absolutely bizarre. Um, it could have been, like I say, that I've had it all along and it's intermittent. I suspect if I left this on for a bit, it would probably kick into life. Uh, and the other clocks are coming out of here okay. I know that. Now, we could have a problem with one of the 74LS74s around here, because those are part of the clock circuit as well. That might be the next issue, but we do know we've got pulsing onto one gate of that particular, you know, one input of that OR gate there. So, that OR gate should be outputting a pulsing signal, not a stuck high, because we don't have a constant high as an input. So it's super confusing what's going on here. I'll switch it on, just get the speaker. We'll do a capture. What seems to be happening, we're getting this BDB5 coming up on the data bus now. I've got no ROM in there. The RAM's isolated because the uh, IC14's removed. Uh, and if I press break, it'll do a capture. And then if I scroll along uh, to the capture if I can. Yeah, you can see there, B5, BD, FF. So this is the last thing I can think to try. Um, after the problems with these chips here, we replaced those. That solved a couple of issues. It solved the problem with the reset. It made the clock reliable, a nice strong clock signal. I think it was weak. That 74HC32 was just like, it, when it warmed up, you lost the clock. And uh, the, re the other one, the 04, it was resetting at a very high frequency. So actually, uh, and it did, the th an interesting thing there is on the Logic Probe, it didn't show up. On the Logic Probe, all you saw was a high which indicated to me that it had come out of reset. But actually on the logic analyzer, it was picking up those reset pulses very, very, very frequently. So, uh, you know, it was a good job I got the logic analyzer on there. It wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been, you know, I would have been totally in the dark. So what I've been doing now is I tested without the CPU. Now, um, this pin down here, this is one of the data pin connections and it was high with no CPU. All the data pins up here were high. So straight away I thought, this is, there is something wrong with the data bus. We should not have highs with no CPU in there. Something is pulling the data bus high. And we saw evidence of that in the logic analyzer there. You know, we had loads of FFs. We did see BDB5, but I think that was just a red herring. I think something was just pulling it a little bit low on a couple of the pins, and it was giving us a slight difference there other than FF. Um, 
So the only other thing I could think of, and you can see I removed the one up here, there was a 74LS245 I think it was, and there's one down here. I removed the first one, tried it, no difference. I've just removed this one, so let's just give that a go. So we've still got the tone, let me just connect the speaker, because that's going to annoy the hell out of us. Uh, just make sure the logic probe's still working, is it? No, hang on, I've not connected my logic probe, just bear with me. So just test the logic probe, and oh my god, we've got a low. That is the first time I have seen the data bus low. Those are pulsing, that could be normal though. The low, that's the main thing. Uh, and the rest of it's low. That would suggest to me that this is fixed. Right, let's get a ROM in it quick. Uh, hang on, well, let me switch it off first and before we uh, create any damage. Let me find the ROM chip. Where is the ROM chip? Yeah, I was thinking we need the ROM, we need the CPU in, so I'm going to go with the original CPU. Um, now I suspect this killed my other Rotwell CPU actually, because that CPU stopped responding at all. It just started outputting nothing but highs on all of its connections. So we'll try with the original CPU, let's try that. Wow, uh, I'm shocked. <laughs> Seriously, let's try it again. Yeah, so we're getting some inconsistent behaviour there. So there might be another fault. Um, now bear in mind, we've not got basic. Uh, I'm not sure what would come up on the screen, if anything. Oh, there we go. Actually, we've got something. Uh, again, I'm shocked, actually. Language. So, yes, it's lacking uh, programming language. So let's try um, and stick the basic ROM. Now, this is the other weird things. This this BBC came with the basic ROM in the far round slot. I'm going to stick it in the second slot because that's where I believe it should be. I don't think it's going to matter. Let's see. See what happens now. See if we get basic. Oh, yes. Suck it, Beeb. Yeah, I'm so, 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 so pleased that this is actually working because I've spent so long actually messing around with this damn thing. Uh, this has been the most difficult repair I have done. It takes quite a while to sync, did you notice that? It takes quite a while to sync with this TV, but it looks crystal clear actually. I'm surprised at how clear that is. Um, now I suspect we might have another issue because it's weird how the sound sort of goes a bit weird sometimes when you're booting on. Let's just try and put mode zero on. Now again, I'm not sure whether my TV will display this. See we've just got a black screen there. So does that mean we've got a problem with mode zero? or my TV doesn't like mode zero, or RAM. I can see something there, can you see that? Uh, you might not be able to see it. Yeah, so I've had to pick the camera up to show you this, but can you see? It's like, that's text, and it's like, it looks kind of weird and bitty. So I think we could have a RAM issue here. Um, I'm not sure why it's not very bright. You know, you'd ex I would expect some more, more visible characters there than that. It's like the colours used are kind of like, I don't know, dark, really dark colours, it's a bizarre. So it's like a palette issue or something. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking of some sort of palette and RAM type issue, I'm not sure. Um, obviously, you know, I'll investigate further. What I can do is just write some basic code to test the RAM now. Now we've made, you know, progress to this stage. But I figure, while we're at this point now, why not start reintroducing some of the other chips? I will just try this, in fact let's just do that now, we'll try that uh, basic ROM in the far right slot where it originally shipped, just because I'm curious, I don't understand. I don't really understand how the Beeb knows which chips are in which slots actually, that is uh, particularly confusing to me actually, let's just try that, see what happens. Yeah, so the Beeb is even more amazing than I originally gave it credit for, the uh, basic ROM being in the far right slot there it's detected it fine. It's a remarkable uh, machine really. Um, okay, let's get some of the other chips onto the board I think. So I put the original via back in here. Uh, whilst I did that I thought I'd just test without the keyboard and you just get a black screen. You get the initial beep and a black screen. Uh, so that's worth knowing. Uh, you know the keyboard is essential to the boot up process on these. Uh, and I was aware of that obviously, you know, because when I was messing around with the pressing brake to do the reset uh, that's you know useful information as well. You know it's a worthwhile test to make sure that when you press brake, you are getting the reset signal uh, toggling on the CPU there. Uh, so let's get the other 6522 back in down here. 
so as you can see pretty well heat synced up actually um, they don't all need heat sinking but I thought well you know it's like I'd, I'd like to try and preserve this 6502 you can get replacement 6502A's like the Rockwell one I already showed I've got some others I've tested those those work all right on here um, and it's the same with the vias I mean I'm, I might get some heat sinks on these vias but actually they're stone cold they're stone cold they're not getting hot whatsoever they will do with use you know you get a disk drive running through this and I'm sure the this one is it or is it yes this one I think for the IO uh, would start getting warm so it might be worth getting heat sink on that but this chip in particular here gets absolutely ludicrous hot, ludicrously hot I was convinced there was a fault with this chip just based on that and I went looking for uh, a replacement um, the other evening actually um, a few people pointed me towards a replacement I might buy one I think it was about 15 20 quid it's nice to have one on standby but you know I took a step back before I went out rushing off ordering parts and things you know trying to follow like a logical methodical sort of way uh, to try and work out where the fault was and the fact that this was output in the four clocks without an issue you know I had my doubts thinking would that really be the fault with this you know if it, would this be interfering with the data bus because that's the thing really the clue here was the data bus and that's what I was trying to focus on um, but it was only really when I got the logic analyzer on we realized there was a problem with the reset and a prob an intermittent problem with the clock you know um, I'm not convinced this not an issue with this yet there might be a third problem I don't know so what I was going to do next um, is get the uh, is write some basic to run through the memory and test the memory uh, and I'll post some links down below that are mega useful uh, one of them is a uh, link to the service manual uh, another one is a picture of this board with all the chips and it details exactly what everything is and I'll run through this uh, that later actually and just talk about what everything is on here and I'll also post a link to that to where you can find that basic list as well there to test your memory to run through and work out which of your chips are faulty because it's really weird I think uh, on the BB on the standard model the A is it I think you don't have the 30, full 64 uh, full 32k you only have 16k and it's something like uh, if memory serves it's like these chips up here or something I think and you've got like like an L shape here that I don't remember this one here that gives you 16k might even be a T shape I can't remember it's, it's you know you you'll see that if you've got an A you'll find that some of these here are socketed this this bank here will all be socketed um, because those are the additional that's like the second you know the second 16k block I think the A ships with some populate up there I think could, could have those around the wrong way I'm not sure so I think we'll split this over two videos actually because there's maybe even three there's going to be so many things that I need to cover here um, you can see I swapped out the ROMs here got some replacement ROMs uh, in advance actually um, it was one of the first things I did because they're only like a couple of pound each and the ones that are, were there you could see you know this is the basic one which was originally over there and all the print was worn off it you can't really read it but they've both got really slack legs you know they've uh, been in and out of the sockets there you know hundreds and hundreds of times probably uh, so these ones now because the, the legs are spread out quite wide they, they fit a lot more snug now you could argue that I could just retention the legs on the other ones but it's always nice to have a couple of spare ROMs so yeah that's that um, the other thing that you'll note here you know I've socketed up the uh, two chips that you could see previously were removed so this is the one that was causing the fault and it's related to one of the ports here I think um, and all it is, it's, it you know, isolates these ports with high impedance, so that you know at the relevant point, the CPU can you know uh, enable the uh, output enable on here, whatever it is, the select signal, and then the data can pass through from one side here to the data bus. You know that that's how it works. So what was happening is the chip that was on here just outputting highs all the time, even though there's nothing connected to these ports here. So you know that's th that's the sort of thing that can be super hard to find because the temperature you know sometimes is a clue. But these were all stone cold, absolutely stone cold. Yet outputting highs, and uh, you've got no chance of working out what's what's doing that where your highs are on your data bus. You've literally got to just start removing things. You know the whole divide and conquer thing, remove a chip look at your data bus, remove a chip, look at your data bus and it's ironic that that ended up pretty much the last chip I couldn't see another chip on the schematics that was outputting anything to the data bus if I'm completely honest so I think that was the last chip uh, sod's love for you um, so you can see the way I've been testing this is with a BNC to uh, RCA uh, adapter here got loads of those from when I was back in the day you know doing networks because the old uh, networks used to use that format actually the old ethernet cables 
I might stick some pins on these actually to make them easily detachable because I don't like the way you've got to keep soldering and desoldering the blooming things every time you take the board off. Uh, I'm not sure if they ever did that as a, a, a legit mod but it would be uh, a desirable thing. You know, I can imagine this one here if it just plugged into a socket and then that one there had a socket and you just plugged the wire into it. You can't get them around the wrong way then either and it just makes it easy to, to take apart. The other thing I'm going to do while I'm here, and perhaps do now actually, is apparently these only have uh, monochrome. Um, now I can't tell because all I've got is black and white at the moment, I haven't got any software to test. Now I've got a problem with some of the video modes as you saw a minute ago. The only mode that seems to work, or the two modes, I'm not sure if there's more than one, is the default mode it boots into and mode 7, which is the teletext mode. Those two are okay, I get white text, no problems any of the other modes, as you saw earlier, I get a black screen with like some really faint, like really dark corruptions or something. As I'm typing I can see things appearing like it is text but I just can't read it. So uh, that pointed me back towards the video ULA here actually. Now bear in mind this is one of the first things I suspect because it gets so super hot. Now this is the new revision one, it's a VTI 2069 is it? It might be the one before that, I don't know, but it's the newer revision, it's not the Ferranti ULA. And these ones aren't supposed to get as hot as the Ferranti. So the fact this gets so hot you can hardly touch it made me think that yeah there's a fault there. And I think now we've got evidence of that, now we've seen the video modes problem that would suggest that that is the case. The only other possibility, um, from what I understand, looking at the schematics, is some of these octal buffers here. There's a, a six of these, I think four of them are used by the, the RAM to limit RAM access. Two of them are used for the video, uh, you know, the, the ULA interaction with the RAM there. So, I mean, I've got a couple of those on order anyway. It's always nice to have spares because those are chips I don't have spares of. I don't think those would cause the issue. I think if those were an issue, we'd see corruptions, we'd see the wrong things there. You know, the text would not be correct, we might have the wrong colours or something like that, I don't know. But it'd be a, a digital sort of problem. Whereas what we're seeing now kind of looks analogy. You know, we've got like an analogy thing where there's, there's a black screen with loads of interference running across it and the, the text is kind of like, there's a contrast problem with the, the, the text output. You know, it's like it's, it's like it's trying to do it but it can't, it's like it's really struggling. And the other thing that supports that, and I'll show you this now, you see this jumper here, uh, S26. Looking at the service manual, this is supposed to invert the uh, output. So, you know, if you swap this over, and let's just power it on now. So, we got a normal boot, and we should just be able to just move it from the uh, east position to the west position, I think. Uh, and this is the other thing when you look at the service manual, it talks about these jumpers in terms of north, south, east, west. And I think, like, I think that's uh, west, it was in east. You know, uh, if you had some of these here that go up and down, like this one here is in the top towards that side, you know, between the top two pins, I'm guessing that's north, and you could move it to south. But anyway, uh, that's just a side note. Uh, have a look at the service manual to cover all the jumpers on the board. It can be a bit uh, uh, mind-blowing when you first start looking at one of these, thinking, oh my God, what do all these jumpers do? Um, they're a lot more simpler than they look. So anyway, so we've moved that across now, so that should invert the video. Now just listen. Did you notice we didn't get the second beep? Oh, we did then. So it's like it's not reliably booting up. I'll just see if I can uh, connect the power. There, the video. Yeah, see, I've got the video connected there. And can you see, we've got a similar problem, if not identical. Yeah, I can't see anything there. Oh, yeah, there you go. Can you see that? Of the brightness there. Look at that. Can you see that? So I think we do have a problem with the uh, the video ULA actually. Um, if I was to hazard a guess, see it's not even, not even booting with that. If I was to hazard a guess, there's something wrong with the inversion. The inversion, I would, if you decapped that chip and had a look inside, I would probably uh, see, I think you'd probably see a short somewhere between the inversion circuitry and whatever it is that the graphics modes do. Um, because it's no coincidence that the inversion doesn't work and neither do the graphics modes. They might even sit next to each other inside the chip. Um, so yeah, I mean it could be two totally independent faults there, but I don't think so because I think in the graphics mode um, problem, you know, if I'll show you now, if we switch to mode zero, the display problem is almost identical to what we see when that jumper is in the inversion position actually. Uh, take a look at the text here. Yeah. Yeah, can you see that? 
so I think the two issues there are combined. So I've ordered a new one of these. Uh, I forget where it's from. I'll tell you when it arrives shortly. I've also got a, uh, what's it called? It's like an MMC interface. It's an SD adapter, basically. And I think you stick a ROM in here for the, uh, you know, the operating system side of things to interface with the device. And it connects up to one of the ports, possibly the user port, I think. I would have thought, I would have expected it to connect to the disk drive port, but I don't think it does. I think it connects to the user port. Um, and then you can obviously you know just load uh, games and programs and things from SD. Now I don't know how flexible that is. One of the um, reviews I looked at suggested that there's a, a file already on there, like one file that comprises of a load of games. So that worries me a little bit. It may well be possible to stick other games and things on yourself. I'm not sure. You may have to compile a f something, you know, to stick a file on there, which is a combination of all the things. I'm not sure, you know, all of the, the programs and things you want to test. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what formats and things will work with it. So we'll have a look at that as well. Um, I might have a look at that in more depth in a separate video in its own right. But right now, coming back to what I was saying, uh, yeah, this outputs mono... Uh, composite but there's a jumper there I'll show you if I just look at the schematics I'll show you what I found on the schematics so we're looking at the uh, beep schematics here from mdfs.net now no if you get the service manual the schematics in the service manual are awful they are seriously awful it's like a not a very high res scan uh, but there is this separate scan it's in a PDF it's just a single file and uh, it's you know the, the schematics seem to seem to cover the A and B models, and I don't think there's. Uh, it may cover all the different revisions. I don't know, but it seems like it seems perfect for mine. Now, this is where I was looking here. Can you see the video out is here? So that's that. That's the video out. The outputs monochrome at the moment. So I started thinking, well, the modular outputs color. So what's the? the there must be a color signal somewhere around here. Uh, and if you just uh, scroll down a little bit here, I forget where it is now. There it is. You can see. Can you see S thirty nine just above my nail there? Um, this is the uh, the chroma signal is coming up there. That's to couple the chroma signal with the video signal going out because obviously you know it's derived and goes to the modulator here. So that's you know I'm pretty sure that S39 will uh, couple the color signal. So I think my suspicions are correct actually. Uh, you know type in say color four. If you just look at this uh, example here, I don't know if you can see this little table uh, for should be blue and we get like just a black there's just no color at all so we do have yet another problem with this BBC uh, it's crazy really but that doesn't surprise me um, in terms of the power supply you know the power supply was the first thing with this uh, you know Ant over at RRG recapped the power supply but at some point it will have been powered up perhaps and the power the caps went in the power supply the power supply you know put some pretty large spikes out onto some of these rails perhaps um, Maybe that did some damage. Yeah, I suspect it, it, it's probably something like that. Because I find it hard to believe that we'd have a problem with the reset circuit, a problem with the clock circuit, a problem with the 74LS245 down here, a problem with the video ULA. I mean, fair, fair enough, this, that's socketed. Someone could have just swapped that over, put a duff one on here before they sold it to Anthony. That's feasible. You know, that's a possibility. But now we've got a colour problem as well, you know, I don't think we've got a RAM problem, I think the RAM's alright, fingers crossed, I haven't seen any indications of any RAM issues yet. Uh, so the next port of call is to look at the colour side of things, try and understand what's going on there. I'm guessing again it's going to be a discrete, one of these discrete uh, ICs down here, a 74 IC uh, that's uh, died again, like the other two or three that have died. Um, but I think that's going to leak into another video. Um, I've covered too many things in this video, I think in the next video um, we'll perhaps uh, have a look back at Logic Analyzer again once this is all working and I'll show you what sort of thing we should see, what I was expecting to see, you know, as a, the boot up on this. We, you know, we can actually have a look at the first few instructions there compared to the, the ROM. Uh, maybe have a look at where it switches over to the basic ROM. That'll be interesting, I guess. And we'll take a look at some games and things as well in the next video. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.